Amen. What a blessing that song was to my heart. And based on the way that y'all were singing it, I trust to yours as well. I did something a little different today during the service and headed towards the back away from my front row perch just to get a glimpse of you all worshiping together, getting to hear you in a different way, see you in a different way. And it's been a blessing to see and to hear the worship of God's people this morning. We've sung about the higher ways of our God, ways that are higher and greater than we can understand, plans that are not always our own. And it's about making plans, making decisions that I'm preaching this morning. There was a New Yorker article back in 2019 that sought to to explain all of the different ways people go about making decisions. Some of the different methods people use, some of the different methods people have used throughout history. When the time came to make a big decision, what was the matrix that was used to craft such a decision? And so Charles Darwin, for example, and I think I'll be the first Baptist preacher this morning to quote Charles Darwin in a message. Charles Darwin would make a list of pros and cons, which I'm sure is not unusual in decision making, but he did so when trying to decide whether or not to propose to the woman who would become his wife. If you go to a museum in London, you can see the list of both the pros and the cons, which for reasons that escape me, he chose to preserve for all of history, (laughs) including his wife, to see. Benjamin Franklin had a little bit more advanced system than just a pros and cons list. He used something he called prudential algebra, where he made that same sort of pros and cons list, but he would assign the different pros and the different cons numerical weights based on how important they were. Not every pro is created equal. Not every con is created equal. So if I was to decide with his method, should I take a nap this afternoon, a con might be, well, I've got some work that I could be doing and that'd be worth one point, but a pro might be, yeah, but it would feel really good and that'd be worth four or five points to be sure. Prudential algebra from our founding father. Corporate firms use scenario planning. Generals use war games. There are all sorts of different methods we use to make decisions And if all else fails, there's always what the ancient Persians did when needing to make a big decision. When needing to make any sort of a big decision, they would discuss them twice. Once while drunk, once while sober. And then make their decision based on the two conversations. Life is full of decisions to make. You can't simply drift through life letting things happen to you. No matter how passive a person you may be, at some point you've got to make a call. You've got to decide, will I get married or won't I? Will I get married to this person or won't I? Will I take this job or that job? Will I buy this house or will I rent here? Will I have kids? And if so, how many? Will I get this car or that car? Will I retire now or wait a few years? Paper or plastic, cash or credit, there's decisions you have to make day after day after day. And making decisions is hard for anybody, for everybody. But arguably, it's even more difficult for believers than for unbelievers because instead of just doing whatever we want, instead of simply going with what feels good, believers try to align their decision with the will of Almighty God. Asking the question, how can I make my decision obediently? Well, 
Our verse this morning is from the book of Proverbs. Proverbs 16, 9. Alicia read it for us a moment ago, saying that the human mind plans the way, but the Lord directs the steps. This book and the little snippets of wisdom like this one, they're, they're all about faithful decision-making. It's part of a broader genre of wisdom literature found in Scripture, along with books like Ecclesiastes and Song of Solomon, all about how do I live in a way that not only benefits my life, but glorifies God and helps others. And so this morning, as we think about how it is we make decisions in our lives, how it is we craft our futures, let's take a look at this balance between the plans you make and the way God allows them to unfold, between exercising your judgment and trusting the Lord, between your ways and his higher ways. Well, let's get this out of the way from, from the get-go, okay? A bad way to make decisions is to simply go with your gut. And I say that not only from personal experience, though I could, but because the Bible is crystal clear that your gut instinct is not to be trusted implicitly. That your general feeling within yourself of this is probably what I ought to do. This is what would help me the most. This is what would feel the best. Well, your gut instinct can lead you down a bad path. Adam and Eve's gut instinct thought that that fruit looked pretty good. That didn't go great. Lot's wife thought she really needed to take one more look back at the old homestead. And her gut let her down. David saw Bathsheba bathing on the roof and his gut instinct said, well, why not? And these are just three of a host of examples in Scripture that show what Jeremiah 17.9 tells us, that the heart is deceitful above all things. And it's beyond cure. Here in this very book of Proverbs, chapter 14, verse 12, it says that there is a way that seems right to man, but its end is the way of death. That's why Proverbs 3, 5 says so famously, to trust in the Lord with all your heart and lean not on your own understanding. Because if you follow your own instincts, if you go with your gut, so often it'll take you somewhere you're not ready to go. And that's why God has given us some incredible tools, has equipped us in such a way that we can make faithful decisions. The Lord has given us Holy Scripture, has given us the Bible as a lamp to our feet, as a light to our path. It illuminates the way for us when it seems so dark. When we don't know where to go, we can refer to Scripture. We can go back to its teachings, to its psalms, to its stories, and glean wisdom and be given discernment. God's given us the Holy Spirit, which he tells us is meant to be our helper, is meant to help us through this thing called life is meant to guide us in the way of Christ so that we're not having to figure it out all by ourselves. He gives us the Holy Spirit so that we can discern what is best. But sometimes, instead of using what we've been given, we just go with what we think would work best. God's given us these incredible tools and we don't put them to use. Whenever I think about the superhero Batman, one of the things I think about is that utility belt that he has. And they've 
I've noticed over the years as the characters gotten more and more realistic in the various films and TV shows, they've kind of de-emphasized it a little bit. They've really focused more on his detective work and his fighting and not so much on the shark repellent bat spray that he used to <laughs> carry around. But back in the day, that belt had anything and everything you could imagine. If he needed to climb a wall, it had what he needed. If he needed a fingerprint kit, it had what he needed. Any tool imaginable Batman had in that trusty utility belt around his waist. He had the tools he needed. Well, guess what, church family? So do we. When it comes to making plans for God's glory and our good, he has given us what we need. He's given us his word. He's given us his spirit. He sent his son to seek and save the lost. So when the time comes to make our plans and to make our decisions, we've got to use the tools we've been given. And then, because this is the second half of that verse, and then when we've made our plans, we've got to do the hard work of entrusting those plans to him. Because it says that the human mind plans the way and the Lord directs the steps. See, the nature of planning, the nature of setting any agenda, crafting any plan, is that at some point, the control is out of your hands. At some point, you've got to stop sitting at the desk and making the plan, and you've got to let it loose and let that plan unfold. If you're an orchestra conductor, you can have practice after practice after practice after practice, but come concert day, you're standing up waving your arms, and it's up to those you've trained to play the music. If you're a football coach, for number one Texas or for number whatever Alabama, then you can practice and practice. You can make the most elaborate playbook imaginable. But on game day, you gotta let the players do their work. Steve Sarkeesian's not out on the field catching passes last time I checked. You make the plan and then you let it unfold. And and that's the hardest part of making plans. That's the toughest thing, is letting them out of your hands. Because left to our own devices, we would rather tinker and tinker and tinker because then we're still in control. One of my favorite albums is Bruce Springsteen's Born to Run. I've got it digitally on my phone. I've got the vinyl record in, in my office. Anytime we go on a road trip, at some point, I'm going to put Born to Run on in the radio. Love that album, and it's usually considered the boss's best. But what you may not know about it is that it took some 14 months to record and release. See, Springsteen knew as he was writing the songs, that this was likely going to be his best work. He knew it was better than anything he'd done before, and it was hard to imagine he'd make anything better afterwards. And so he put his nose to the grindstone, and he wanted it to be perfect, just as he imagined it in his mind. And so day after day, week after week, month after month, he and the band went into the studio recording for sometimes 18 hours over a day and then going into the production booth to see how it sounded. And yet, after 14 months, he still wasn't satisfied. He wanted to keep recording. He wanted to keep tweaking here and there. And it fell to his producer to finally say, it's done. You've got to let it go. We're all like that to some degree. Because there are three things that people are irrationally attached to. Their pets, their sports teams, and their plans. 
we love them. We don't want to let them go. But when it comes to those plans, faith means turning over control. It means trusting God with the future. It means being okay when God takes you down a different path than the one you envisioned, than the one you charted out. Because while you made the plans, he's directing the steps. Because while you made the decision, he's the one who holds the future. See, here's the thing, church family. Every single one of us wants to know what the future holds. Every single one of us wants to know what is coming next. At your workplace, in your family, at your church, in the stock market, everybody wants to know what's going to happen. But God didn't give us a crystal ball. He didn't give us a stack of tarot cards to know the future. No. No. What he calls us to do is to know him well, to read his scripture faithfully, to listen to the leading of the Holy Spirit. And then when we have made our decision, when we've crafted our plan, when we've charted our path, to turn it over to him to trust him with what happens next. It's an impossibly hard thing to do sometimes. It's an impossibly difficult thing to trust someone other than yourself with the future. But our God sent his very son to this world to live and die and rise again for our salvation so that we could know eternal life with him. Jesus paid it all and all to him we owe. And that includes our futures. That includes turning over to him that which we hold on to the tightest. Trusting in the Lord with all of our heart instead of leaning on our own understanding. See, the human mind is what plans the way And may you do it faithfully. May you employ the tools you've been given. For the human mind plans the way. But it's the Lord that directs the steps. May we go where he leads. Would you pray with me? Father God, I thank you for this day. And I thank you that you are worthy of our faith, worthy of our trust, worthy of our hope. I thank you that you hold the future in your hands. I pray, Lord, that as we each and as we all make our plans, as our human minds craft the way, make the plans, make the decisions. I pray, Lord, that at the forefront of those decisions would not just be our good, but would be your glory. That with eyes fixed on Jesus, the author and the perfecter of our faith, we would seek to align ourselves with your will that we would listen to the leading of your spirit, that we would read the words of Holy Scripture, and that by doing so, we would be able to discern where you're taking us. So Father, as we make our decisions and craft our plans, may we do so for your glory. And may we trust that in making those decisions, in drawing up those plans that what you bring about will be for your glory and for our good. May we place our faith 
not in our own capabilities, not in our own understanding, but may we trust in you as you direct our steps. May we follow where you lead. It's in Jesus' name that I pray, amen.